progress. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. All right. Uh, are you guys good? Just get started. All right. All right, y'all. Uh, today we're going to be kind of covering a continuation of Tuesday's lecture. Um, so we're going to be going over. Also, is the mic good? Is it good? All right. Perfect. We're going to be going over uh, image segmentation and sync segmentation as well. So, I guess what is image segmentation? Uh, so, I guess a review of yesterday, right? Things we went over. We started with a classification network, right? That essentially, you know, like took an image and then told you what was in the image, right? We moved from that to classification with localization, or we went to landmark detection and then classification with localization, which is essentially telling us, you know, what's in the image and where is it, right? Uh, oops, it's got stuck. There we go. And then finally, we went to object detection. So essentially, having you know multiple objects in an image, being able to tell what they are, and being able to tell where they are, um, all individually. So the continue of the continuation of that is semantic segmentation. Sorry, segmentation. So the first we break these into two types: semantic segmentation and instant segmentation. The basic idea behind Semantic segmentation is that instead of just finding a bounding box of an image or of a certain object, right, we want to actually find like the specific pixels where that object is present in the image, right? And the continuation of this is instance segmentation, which essentially is answering the question, you know, where specifically is each instance of each class in this image? As in, if we have a photo with, you know, a bunch of people in it, it will not only be able to tell the exact pixels that correspond to people, but it will also be able to tell, you know, like which sections of those are corresponding to each individual person. Um, and again, and again, we can have multiple classes in this as well, right? So we could have, you know, like an image that you know has a bunch of people and a bunch of dogs, and it should be able to tell each individual dog and each individual person in the background, et cetera, right? So again, to give kind of an example of this, right? It's like we have some images here, right? It's like, you know, we could have this image right here where there's a person and you know grass and trees in the sky and it's able to kind of pick out all of these different components and it's able to kind of um, segment them. Although again, notice we're talking about semantic segmentation to start, so it can't, for example, differentiate between like each individual cow here, right? It's just classifying this is cow and kind of marking it as such, right? So this is what we're going to start with, um, but the eventual goal, right, is that we want to be able to detect, you know, like everything, right? We want to be able to look at an image, right? Break it down into kind of all of the different separate components, right? Like you can see this image, like we have all of the different individual people are being detected differently. There's like two boats or like a bunch of boats, actually, a bunch of boats that are all kind of being detected separately as well, right? Like this is kind of the ideal end case, right? This is like what we are trying to accomplish, what we would really like. So why is this useful? Um, because this may seem like a lot of work. It may seem kind of scary because it's like it, it seems like quite a bit of a step up from just picking a little box on an image to actually like classifying the exact like positions of everything, and kind of separating this all out. Um, so I guess I can hope I can convince you guys this is useful. So first of all, we have this whole idea of the Gestalt principles. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but the basic idea, right, is that there's a lot of different components that go into how humans kind of perceive things, right? How they perceive objects, right? It's like, if you look at this image, for example, right? It's like, I think these are little, you know, balls of like yarn or something like that, right? It's like, you know, is this, you know, maybe you're, you're seeing each of these individual bars of yarn, right? They all have like, you know, different colors on them, but what your brain is processing is this kind of gradient, right? It's like the whole idea is that the individual components, or sorry, the <laughs> sum of the whole image is more than just like the collection of the individual components, right? We want to be able to actually, you know, classify and like pull all of these different things together and then come up with some meaning based on that, right? So being able to kind of identify all those components of the image more specifically is really useful. So um, other kind of just cool aside of this um, that I think is kind of interesting as well is that even just determining, you know, like what an object is or the way that we kind of perceive things is, is a more challenging question than, uh, maybe you might might think it is uh, in the sense that like, if you look at this image, right? This is just a bunch of like weird curved lines, right? Everywhere, but 
you probably see a circle, right? Because the kind of components of the lines change color at a, you know an area that kind of you know happens to match that circle, right? And so it's like, how could we you know kind of like get these different groupings, these kind of perceptual groupings? How could we kind of figure that out? You know, how could we do that from a, a network perspective? Additionally, you can see this example on the right of this little you know set of weird shapes moving. Uh, I'm sure you guys all see that that kind of looks like a dog, right? Even though it's objectively like not following the shape of a dog, right? Like if we were to, you know, talking about RCNN yesterday or Tuesday, if you guys remember, right? If we were to like, you know, pick out the different components of this object, right? And we were to, you know, like create bounding blocks on them, right? The object of a dog is not actually connected, right? It's a bunch of different kind of subcomponents that all kind of come together. So again, th really the point of this is to kind of motivate segmentation, right? And why this is like a useful thing for us to look into, right? Because the idea is that if we're able to kind of identify all these different components, but we're also able to more generally, you know, connect different, you know, classifications or, or kind of do larger level, you know, uh, uh, segmentation, this becomes a really, really useful uh, ability to have. So again, yeah, segmentation is just really, I, there's a lot of like really abstract speaking, but the basic idea is just segmentation is telling you which pixels go together. Right, like taking an image, telling you these two are pointing or the same thing, right? These two are different. So, how do we approach segmentation? So, there's actually a component of this that we brushed over last lecture. Uh, we actually referenced segmentation in the RCNN section again when we were talking about region proposal, where we were essentially saying that we will use some magical classical, you know, region proposal method that will just magically look at an image and propose to us boundaries that might be good regions to classify on, right? And so we're actually going to take a look at like what that actually means, how it's kind of implemented. Um, there's obviously lots of different methods to this, but the, the simplest possible way that we could kind of approach this is as follows. Well. So first of all, the idea that we're looking for is to create connected segments by grouping based on some sort of similarity criteria, right? So if we have, you know, like this image right here, right? Maybe we want to, you know, group together potentially the cards, or maybe we want to group together the, you know, individual components, like, you know, little spades on this playing card, right? It's like we want to group together visually distinct objects on a maybe not so distinct image. So let me just, uh, yeah, there we go. So one way to approach this is that we can essentially define some function by which we were to group image or pixels together. Right, is in if we have some image, right? Like let's say we have this image down here, and we pick point, you know, this point right here, which maybe is x1, y1, and then we pick, you know, a point next to it, x2, y2, right? And we can say we can have some sort of function that takes in the point, returns some like similarity criteria. We can essentially say if the difference between those two, if those two are pixels are similar enough to each other, their difference is below some epsilon, then we group them together, right? And so this is like a very simple kind of classical approach to this problem. Um, and there's a lot of different similarity functions or like, like metrics that you could use to measure similarity. A classic one is just, you know, intensity. So like the brightness of a pixel, that's not the technical definition, but you can think of it as, right? It's like the intensity of a pixel is like how kind of bright that color is, right? So for example, if we look at you know this pixel right here and this pixel right here, right, they are pretty similar in color, but they're not too like they're, they're I mean they're they're pretty similar in color, but they're a little different, right? But their overall brightness is similar enough that that difference there is going to be less in this classification, and so then we would kind of merge those two pixels together in the sense that we would consider them part of the same group, right? And then kind of you know flood bill outwards here. Right. And then maybe we'd get an image that looks like this threshold image on the right, where essentially, you know, there's the uh, white section is like all of the kind of pixels that have been grouped into this one, you know, collective segment. Right. Um, so there's lots of other ways to kind of approach this. But uh, the idea is that's kind of, a, I guess, a very, very basic classical approach to this algorithm. Now we're going to look at some, you know, newer, maybe deep learning approaches to this. So one way that we could kind of do segmentation that's a little bit more interesting uh, because it's learned as opposed to a fixed algorithm is we can go back to that sliding windows idea that we talked about on Tuesday, right? Except this time, instead of doing sliding windows in an attempt to classify a bounding box, what we can essentially do is 
we can slide windows across the image. And then we can have for each like you know slide of the CNN, that current box, its only goal is to classify the middle pixel of that box, right? In the sense, like if we had you know this red square down here, right? It's running classification on this patch of the image, and then it's outputting what it thinks the middle pixel is, right? And so what this allows us to essentially do is, is we can run this CNN sliding window across the image, and every time it outputs, it'll output you know, what object that should be a part of. And then on our output image, like our segmentation map, we can just write that you know, value to, to the corresponding pixel, right? So we're sliding across, and you know, maybe this pixel is saying sky, this pixel is saying tree, this pixel is saying tree, this pixel is saying tree, this pixel is saying cow, this pixel is saying cow, right? We can kind of run all the way over, and then we'll kind of be able to create that segmentation map like that. Uh, this is, as we saw last time, sliding windows approaches in general just it, it's just very inefficient, right? It's like once again, we're we're you know recomputing a bunch of shared features, right? We're kind of you know running the classification over the same area um, lots of times. So how do we fix this, right? Well, we, we talked about this again on Tuesday, uh, but there's this is kind of a different approach to it. So we can do convolutions end to end again, right? We can just take convolutional network. Uh, instead of running it multiple times, we can just have you know one sort of convolutional operation that we can run over the image that ideally will perform all of the desired effects that we want um, without having to do the sliding window approach. So in this case, uh, what we essentially have, or, so, okay, to clarify, there's one kind of caveat to this situation, which is that last lecture, we were talking about you know, classification, like detection, that kind of thing. And so our output was a defined size, right? In the sense that we were like, when we're talking about the case of classification with localization, our output was going to be one classification, one you know, x and y coordinate pair, and one width and height pair, right, for the value box, right? Whereas Theoretically, with segmentation, we want our output to be the same size as the input and essentially contain, you know, in every single pixel, tell us what that object is, right? So one kind of bonus of this end-to-end -end convolutional approach uh, is that the, it, the, the whole system is, is size agnostic of the input. Um, and so you may be like, it's, it's maybe a little bit confusing, so like, well, if we're plugging the image into the convolutional neural network, like how, how is it size, like isn't it expecting a certain number of inputs, that kind of thing. Uh, but essentially the way that you can think about it is that if our convolutional layer, right, is that um, you can use that like kind of filter explanation where we have, you know, a convolutional kernel or like a filter that's kind of running along the image, right? And then it just, you know, goes on by the step size moving over each time. Uh, if we just take that filter and keep running it, Right? There's no required you know, like size. Right, We're not decreasing the size of the network using pooling layers or anything like that. We're literally just running the convolutional network over, getting an output layer that's exactly the same. You notice this is uh, three channels. Like if we look at the, the actual numbers, right? this input image is three channels, like the red, blue, and green channel, and then uh, a width and a height. Right, When we run our convolutional layer over, right, we're still getting a you know, width by height length volume, right? It might have more depth or less depth depending on how many channels we have internally. But the basic idea is, right, we're just passing that convolutional filter over. So we don't have to worry about like, you know, the size changing or that kind of thing. We can just kind of run everything over and our predicted output um, will we'll map one to one, you know, exactly with the original image. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, great question. So uh, yes, theoretically, um, there's a couple different ways that we can we can do this. So first of all, if we have like Naomi get some chalk. So for example, like let's just take a very trivial example where we have like a two by two image, right? And let's say our filter is three by three, right? So one thing that we could do is uh, we could essentially use padding. Right. So the idea is if we just like uh, the padding is like complicated and it shouldn't necessarily just do this, but let's just say we add zeros to the outside, like all the missing pixels in the image. Right. Now, when we run our three by three filter over, right, it's going to run here 
it's going to output that into, you know, uh, maybe it's going to output that into the first pixel, right? And then when we shift it over one, it's again using up those padding bits, right? To classify this one or to, to run on this one, it's going to move into there, right? And the idea is if we have, you know, stride one and we have enough padding, right? It's like we're not going to be, we don't have to be decreasing that size. Um, and I guess just quick aside, but when doing padding and that kind of thing, there's a lot of different, I don't know if we've talked about this yet, um, but like padding with zeros is kind of weird because then it's essentially you're like treating the, the network is seeing as if there's like a black wall at the edge of the image. Um, there's a bunch of different kind of approaches to like fix this. Um, yeah, one second. One of, one of the things you can do is like, you can kind of mirror the edges. So for example, we can take these pixels and like duplicate them here, or like even better, you can take like this whole thing and then like flip it over and kind of duplicate. So the, the padding kind of matches the colors on the inside. Uh, but yeah, great question. You had a question? Yes. Yeah, so in the figure, right? Why does taking the artifacts or do you take an artifacts and just like go to the after the layer? How does that do you have like this like big picture problem how do you get to like the final um thing like, things from that? Yeah, so the basic idea here, um okay, okay, really you can kind of just think of it as uh essentially as we kind of go through these convolutional layers, right? And then as we kind of get to the final output, the final output is going to be a volume that has size width the width by height of the image. And then the depth of it is essentially each slot in the depth is talking about a certain classification output. So the idea is we're our max, we're essentially finding the maximum classification output for each pixel. So that's like the number of classes. Yeah, exactly. C is, C would be the number of classes that we have. And so so uh you yeah i mean th there's lots of different like we, we talked about this a little bit last time like there's different ways to like kind of encode things but for right now just think of it as it's like a one hot encoding where like each class you know maybe there's a one if it's sky there's a there's a one in the next but if it's you know like a cow or etc um does that answer your question all right great yeah, so, oh yeah, okay. So the problem with this is that uh, it's pretty expensive to compute this at the original image resolution, right? And and what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, let's say you have like a 4K image, right? And it's like, maybe you have, I don't know, like 20 convolutional nodes or something, right? I'm just coming up with random numbers, right? But it's like, the idea is we're, still doing that, excuse me, we're still sliding that filter over, right? And doing that kind of computation on like every single pixel, right? It's like, we're still doing quite a bit of work, right? And so as long as we kind of maintain that original resolution, right? It's gonna be kind of hard to, uh, you know, shrink that down. So one potential solution to this um, is to essentially downsample the image gradually um, and then upsample it at the end. So, what do I what do I mean by that? Well, essentially, um, what we can think of is if we look at this image here, right? It's like we have this input image, right? And then when we run our you know first convolutional layer, right? We can instead of doing this like you know padding thing where we we like want it to be the exact same size and having like a stride one or that kind of thing, we can you know maybe up the stride a little bit, get rid of a little bit of padding, right? Do something like that, uh, so that the output of running the convolutional convolutions over once is going to be smaller than the original input image, at least smaller in width and height, maybe it's a little deeper or something, right? But the idea is we're, we're kind of shrinking it down. And each time we're kind of shrinking the image down further and further, um, all the way down to like in this example, it's like, I don't know, it's 21 or something. I, I don't actually remember what these numbers are, but the point is, right? It's like the volume that we're outputting is getting smaller each time. So we're essentially down sampling the image every single time, right? You can think of it as we're taking the image, right? The convolutional neural network ideally is going to be like extracting information, right? Removing redundancy from the image as it kind of passes over. And each level is getting like more and more like abstract in the sense of like it's, you know, ideally maybe would be collecting, like the first pass would be like collecting information on like edges or that kind of thing. And then the second pass would be like, you know, combining those different features to like maybe get more, you know, high level understanding of the image or something like that, right? It's like, it's all just theorizing. But the, the whole point is that we're kind of downsampling this, we're getting down to a much smaller kind of volume at the end. 
But then of course we have this problem that we want our output, our segmentation output to be the same size as the input image, right? Because we don't want to like output, if we input a 4K image, we don't want to output like a two pixel by two pixel segmentation map, right? Because that's not going to be very useful if the, the pixels don't really match. So we somehow need a way to kind of take this small volume and somehow transform that small volume back into an image the size of the full image, right? Which is a little is a little weird, right? Like how do we how do we do that? So there's yeah, how do we upset? Um, so there's a couple ways to do this. The classical approach that uh, or a classical approach that I'm sure if you guys have ever used Photoshop or done anything with that in the past, you guys have definitely seen this before. Um, where you know I don't know if you guys ever use MS Paint, but if you put an, put an image in MS Paint and you like scale it up a little bit. It gets all like pixelated and gross because MS Paint is, I'm pretty sure by default using nearest neighbor, or at least maybe it used to, um, which is disgusting. But <laughs> essentially the basic idea is when you scale up an image, um, there's, you can essentially think of it as we're stretching the pixels out. And then now there's kind of new spaces for new pixels to be formed. And so a interpolation function is essentially deciding like what those new pixels should be, right? How to kind of blend between you know, the two pixels we had already that are now separate enough that there's a new one that's needed in between. So nearest neighbor, um, this is the one that I was, was making fun of. Essentially the basic idea is that we're literally just taking the value of the pixel it's most adjacent to. So if we have a small, tiny image and we scale it up really large, we're just gonna get giant pixels because we're not doing any sort of blending. We're literally just selecting the nearest pixel. Um, you can do, you know, like, some sort of a linear interpolation where it's like you take the two edge pixels and you find the color that's halfway in between them, right? And it's like, you can do something like that. Uh, the option that like most uh, software use, like if you use Photoshop and you try to scale up an image, um, I believe the default is going to be it's either bilinear or bicubic interpolation. Um, but essentially the idea is that it's essentially taking, you know, the color information from, you know, both the pixel, like, you know, the pixels to the side and also the pixels up and down um, and essentially kind of computing some sort of linear like average between those um, to find the output color. Uh, and so the idea is that if we take, you know, like this image on the right, right? And it's like, we want to stretch out to four times the size, right? We can put those pixels on the corners and then we can use like bilinear interpolation, interpolation to kind of fill in the missing spots, right? And this like theoretically works, right? Like it's not like a wrong approach. Uh, but the issue with this is that what we're really doing is essentially scaling up the image and then blurring it a little bit, as opposed to filling in detail that we're missing, right? And so a way that we can improve this is by, once again, we can move from a classical algorithm to a learned algorithm, right? So the idea is we want to upsample, but instead of upsampling with, you know, like bilinear relation or something like that, we want to have some sort of, you know, neural algorithm or something uh, that can learn how to upsample images, right? So uh, I already kind of went over this, but like just, I want to do a quick review of convolutions because I'm about to introduce something called a deconvolution, which is pretty easy to understand if you understand convolutions. So I guess just very briefly, I can go over again, like, right, it's like you have, you know, like a, a filter that you're kind of passing over, like in this case, three by three. Um, and you're essentially taking you know, all of those values and then you're multiplying them by the weights of the filter and then kind of summing those all up and putting it in the corresponding output pixel, right? And then you, you know, shift over by the stride each time and you kind of keep passing on through that until you've you know, gone through the entire uh, thing. So the other thing you can kind of think of is how can we kind of reverse this process, right? Like we want to take essentially the same, like a kernel idea of a kernel, like kind of passing over an image, right? But instead of, passing over, you know, the, uh, you know, some sort of input layer and then getting a smaller output layer, we kind of want to take this and do the opposite, right? We want to pass over a small input layer and somehow project that through some sort of filter uh, onto a larger output, right? So to that, uh, enter the deconvolution. So it's literally, I just flipped the diagram, right? We have the smaller one on the left and then the larger one on the right. Uh, and so the basic idea is, we're literally, like you can kind of think of it as we're literally flipping the diagram that we had before. And I'll get into how that actually works in a second. But so instead of passing the filter over the input layer, you can think of it as we're passing the layer over the output and removing pixel by pixel 
on the input, right? So actually, I have some slides here, but honestly, I think it's going to be a little easier if I just draw it. So I'm just going to draw an example. Let's say we have, you know, one, or that's not a one. I can write numbers. All right, one, two, three. Also, is my handwriting way too small? Can you guys see? You're good. I'm good? Perfect. Okay, one, two, three, four. Let's just say we have this very simple input image, right? And we want to upscale it to like a three by three, right? So what I said before is we can start, let's say, uh, then let's also say we have like a three by three kernel, right? So uh, I'm going to make this kernel very simple. And let's just say it's like, uh, I go like one zero one zero one zero one zero one just for fun. I don't know. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off. We're gonna look at the first pixel of the first image, right? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our filter, and we're gonna place our filter over the output layer, centered around this pixel. Okay. And essentially, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take this input value. And we're going to multiply it by each of the output values in the output, or sorry, by each of the filter values. And we're going to essentially project that or kind of imprint that onto the output, right? So in this case, like if this box were placed over, like this whole section is just like outside of the range. So I don't have to worry about that, right? But you can kind of think of it as it would be, you know, maybe uh, like one, you know, one times one, right? That's going to go there. One times zero. That's going to go there, right? Like one times zero, and then one times one, right? So on the very first pass, we've kind of added, and again, this is just this number multiplied by this, and then placed on the corresponding slot on the output, right? And so we can do that once, and we get some values kind of magically appear here, right? And then all we have to do is we can shift over to the next pixel, right? And now what we can do is we can maybe you know shift this box over as well, All right? So maybe now the fil this filter is now looking at this region centered here, right? And we can say, okay, let's take two, two times two is, or two times one is two, right? So this is now two, right? We can say, you know, two times zero is zero, right? Two times one is two, right, et cetera. The, the point is you can keep doing this, right? But you may see a problem with this, which is that we're gonna end up like overwriting values that were written and it's like kind of weird it's like what's the, the point of this right well the idea is that if we would add a value to a node that's already has a value in it, we just add them right so the idea is is that these output values are essentially going to become like a sum of the kind of projection of the input values through the filter press onto that image right so I'll go over it kind of again, because that's a little bit weird, but you can kind of think of it as, you know, it's like we have this input pixel, we multiply each weight in the filter by this input pixel, and then kind of think about it as like we're pressing that down onto the output image, and if there's already a value there, we just sum it up, right? Um, and again, we can keep shifting that over. Um, yeah, and so that's a, that's a deconvolution. Um, so using this, we can do something a little cooler which is that we can take like essentially an incremental approach to the problem, right? Where we can, you know, start with this really large image and then we can run the convolutions, convolutions over it to downsample it into some, you know, low res internal representation with maybe some depth, but it's like, you know, pretty small. Um, and then what we can do is we can use deconvolutions to start raising the size back up, right? To slowly upsample. Um, and I guess there's two benefits of this approach as opposed to the approach that we talked about previously. So first of all, the big one is that the upsampling is learned. It's not just a classical algorithm, right? It's something that can learn and can you know, adapt to the problem that we give it, which means that instead of just like filling in, you know, the blend of the pixels with like what the like average color value is, right? It's like theoretically, the desampling could kind of learn to, you know, maybe like fill in certain edges or like knows a certain shape. And so when upsampling, it might refine that shape a little bit, right? It could do, you know, different cool kind of approaches like that. 
Um, and secondly, the reason that we're doing this upsampling like slowly instead of just doing it in like one giant push um, is, is essentially just that we get like, you know, more chance for, you know, if, we, if you think about like doing this uh, deconvolution process, right? It's like there's more intersection between things. There's more opportunity for overlap if we kind of do that over multiple passes. Yes. Uh, so like, the first half of the network, like, I feel like you think it's on level like max or something that would like, Yeah. Yes. So, so the deconvolution itself is does upset, right? Because I mean, like in the example that we just showed, right? It's like the input was right. smaller than the output. Yeah. You, if you had a like greater than one stride and you didn't pad, yes, for sure. Uh, so then there's no sort of like function in the what? In the what? Sorry. So well, the upsampling function is the deconvolutional. Like there's no additional upsampling. Yeah, yeah, it's entirely just convolutional. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, yeah. So if we take this approach um, and add in a couple little bells and whistles, which we'll get into in a second, uh, we get something called unit. So. The basic idea about unit is that it's combining all the kind of previous improvements we talked about uh, with the addition of one little fancy feature, which is skip connection. So I don't think, I don't know if we've talked about those we have. Great. Okay. I don't have to explain it. So current skip connections idea, right? The, the whole idea is that, you know, it's like it can pull in, you know, information from, you know, less processed parts of the process um, up all the way till the very end, right? And so you can see, right, we have this image. As we kind of pass through, we're slowly like downsampling it until we get to this internal state. And then we start upsampling. But when we're doing the upsampling, we pull in information from the corresponding level of the downsampling path. So the idea is like, you know, for example, in the very last section of the network, right? It's like we're pulling in like potentially like detail information from the component over here, right? Which is why these skip connections are really, really powerful and they work really well for this type of task. Um, yeah, so modern segmentation models, like it's essentially like there's a lot of continuations on kind of UNET, a lot of similar approaches. Um, I can just, you know, yeah. So for a while, family of models, deep, deep lab family of models, which state of the art, nature ants took over and recently transformer based models like Sendformer have resulted. So the main kind of contributions of these were essentially just, you know, different methods to kind of better capture image information at like multiple scales. So like as you if you guys want to look at these charts later you can you can check them out but essentially just like you know different different sets of connections and different kind of rates of down sampling and, and different kind of approaches like that um so all the things that we've been covering so far have been about uh like semantic segmentation right it's just classifying like this is cow right as opposed to this is a cow and then this is a different cow right so how do we kind of expand this to instant segmentation so one approach to this, we can go back to our old friend, RCNN. We can expand it a little bit to just solve this problem for us. So if you guys remember RCNN, right? Again, the basic idea is we use like a classical method to propose potential segments. And then we, you know, essentially like, you know, find like crop the image to each of those segments and then run the classification on there. And then if it matches, then we output that banding box. And otherwise we combine segments and then keep doing that over and over again, right? It's like, I'm sure you guys remember this was a couple of days ago. Uh, but so essentially mask RCNN is a continuation of that where once we've kind of cropped that image down, right? We classify it, but then we also, uh, we also add kind of an output mass prediction, right? Where essentially we run one of these methods, right? To essentially, you know, predict the location or run one of those, you know, segmentation methods to essentially identify that current object, right, within that kind of bounding box. And so the idea then is that if one bounding box outputs, you know, like this shape or whatever as like a person, right, and then a different bounding box outputs, you know, this shape as a person, we can tell that even though they're both classified as people, they're different people because they represent different objects, right? So yeah, you guys can see some, some examples of this, right? This is like, some, some examples running, right? It's like able to kind of detect the different airplanes, able to detect all the different people. Um, and you can see these mass predictions that are coming out, 
right? Like these are corresponding to some people. Um, again, they're they're scaled to the shape of bounding blocks because RCNN. Uh, but so you can see that those kind of are all all working, and then they're scaled back up to kind of match the corresponding um, output. And so yeah, here's an example of this running. Um, so full instance segmentation using mask RCNN. So you can tell this is for like a like self-driving type, you know, uh, purpose where it's detecting the, you know, outlines of cars, the outlines of people, pedestrians, like it's able to detect this backpack on the person as well as kind of identifying uh, each of these different peoples and each of these different cars as, as separate objects. Um, yeah, that's, I believe that's about it as far as the slides. Does anyone have any questions right now? Yes. Yeah, you can kind of think of it as um, it, it's a little bit simpler because we have uh, the not that you just like have to remember all the details of this, but when we're doing RCNN, the when we pick like a potential bounding box and try to run it on like classify, um, we essentially like squish it down into like a, a certain size box and then we run the um and then we run the classification on it. So the idea is that we are guaranteed to have like a certain fixed size image. So we don't necessarily have to do like a fully convolutional, like there's different kind of ways that you can do the segmentation. But yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yes. What is the label? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so you know, Jamel, I'm not actually sure how they collect it. Do you guys? Do any of you guys know how they collect data to um train the segmentation stuff on? Um, people, uh, so for example, if you're looking for a label, people, you know, like tools but your outline or mm. just keeping points, not the outline person, and then not supposed to change the code and then the people doing the polish. Yeah, that's one option. <laughs> you just have people to do it for you, just arbitrarily create the training data for you. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, sometimes you do the classic assistant methods. Uh, or nowadays you also do resistant implementation methods. So we're just going to adjust it. Uh, it works basically the same way. Uh, for classical or kind of like into segments into different colors, and you can select which ones like form an object together. Uh, it could also be forms like an object for you, and just adjust it. But yes, we still have a lot of work. So, Thanks, Bob. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Um, how do you choose the user matrix for the model? So that's learned in the same way that you choose a filter for a convolutional neural network. It's just the weights, essentially. Uh, yeah. Yes. How much does the convolution How is the what? The deconvolution? Yes. So, I mean, essentially, like, it's kind of hard for me to answer that question without like having a bunch of like labels and everything. But essentially, it's like it, it's really just the exact process that I was talking about before, right? It's, it's it's literally just a projection. You take the filter, you multiply each value in the filter by the uh, you know value of that corresponding pixel or that corresponding uh, slot, and then you essentially you know you're you're iterating your filter over the uh, image. You're, you're iterating your multiplied filter over the image. And essentially, at each point of the iteration, you just add the spot at that corresponding filter to the spot in the output, um, and then you just kind of keep passing that. Yes. Question was more of uh, for convolution, it's like vector matrix multiplication, but what's the convolution? Ah. <laughs> mm. You know, I can't actually remember. I can't remember off the top of my head how this is optimized. Um, I don't remember. I can get back to you on that one. Sorry about that. Yes. Is it like this operation like the inverse of the operation? So not really. I know I presented it like that. Um, it's not actually like inverting a convolution. It's just easy to kind of think about that. Like 
it's easy to think about it that way. It's not really doing like an inverse of like a convolutional operation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the between those are called the transcript language, the recording is going to be It's a bit hard to define that. It's more of a process that you kind of have to know. Yeah, I'm sure there are like formal definitions of like like essentially efficient ways to, to optimize this. We didn't actually look into this for this class. Again, the, the point of this is not to like have you guys implement, you know, uh, like Hi, George. It's just be able to like understand like conceptually what this is doing, and then just trust that the people who wrote the algorithms implemented it in some fast matrixy way um, that I actually don't know. I just don't know off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay, great. Rohan, do you want to show the demo? Yeah. I said you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. One second, I'll like this real quick just so I can open up the. Wait, sorry, which one? Can you? <laughs> oh, se semantics, like tiny URL. Uh, okay, okay. Should you just be able to run this? All right, let me, I stopped screen sharing. Uh, Give me one second. Uh, can you walk through it? Let me screen share again. All right, perfect. I can give you my cue. Oh, yes. Hello. So yeah, uh, this is just a, a quick demo of a, a trained model that was trained on a cloud TPU. This is an instant segmentation model. Um, so literally all the details are abstracted away. This is just like a visual representation of how instant segmentation would look post implementation. Um, so yeah, we don't even need to run this. Uh, essentially this, the Cocoa data set has a bunch of IDs. Um, this is just a map of all of those um, to reassociate what the segmentation model says to whatever it's like ground truth label is. Yeah, so this is the image they passed in. Um, I think this is somewhere in Japan. Uh, all of this is, is literally just calling the model that has been pre-trained. Um, and yeah, okay, so this is this is kind of what I wanted to show. Uh, this is an example of instant segmentation. Um, so as you can see, there are multiple people that it's detecting in various capacities. It's also able to detect things like umbrellas with a like 50% accuracy score. It's a little more secure on other things. As you can see, it looks like there are two people behind this umbrella. It was not able to get the second one. Um, but what's interesting about this model is that you can give it a score threshold to predict on. Um, so if you were to increase, okay, so you can also visit the URL for this. It's tinyurl.com slash semantic dash seg. Um, and then you can actually play around with the, the parameters. But if you were to increase this to 70, a lot of the, actually, maybe running through it is a good idea. You'll post a link on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have a little time, so. If you guys want to follow along, tinyurl.com slash semantic dash seg. All right, so if the min threshold is increased, you're only accepting information where you have a very high likelihood of the semantic segmentation being accurate. So as you can see, the handbag goes away, all of these people go away, 
And the only people that we see are things that the model can very confidently say it can draw a bounding box around with over whatever 76% accuracy. So this umbrella is exactly the boundary. Um, and the, the pre-training, the, the beauty of this model is that you can pre-train a lot of things on the cloud, on like AWS, a lot of offloaded services and bring them together in a notebook like this. So your homework is gonna also be a cloud notebook, I believe. Uh, resident assignment is mandatory and the unit one is optional, but I would highly recommend doing the unit one. I think a lot of it is done for you um, and Arian can talk more about that as well. So feel free to come to office hours if you have any questions about that. I'm oh, sorry. That is due, I think it's being released tomorrow night. Okay, it'll be over a week from now, so. Uh, and it's also, everything is on the course website, so all the due dates and assignment links will be there. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. You can ask me or Ryan or Ryan or Val any questions if you guys have any. Yeah, you're still on back to church, man. <laughs> <laughs>